In this video, we brew on the Robo Brew Generation 3 for the very first time, and that's coming up next. How's it going? My name's Brian. I'd like to welcome you to another video. If this is your first time here and you'd like to learn more about electric brewing, see product reviews just like this one, and all sorts of other home brewing related stuff, consider subscribing. And if you do, don't forget to click the bell so you don't miss anything. This is a continuation of my previous overview and first look at this unit. And today we're going to be doing a step mash. And I did a little bit of research on step mashing. And it's not really something that is very necessary anymore because most of our malts are fully modified. The unit is made to do it. And so I wanted to try it. I said I was going to do that for you so that you would know how it works and how to do it. What we are doing today is an American wheat beer. And that beer is uh, six pounds of white wheat malt and five pounds of pale malt. We actually have a malting company in Marion, Ohio, which is not too far away. And uh, they produce some pretty good pale malt, so I'm gonna go local with them. And uh, so here's uh, what we're gonna do, is we're gonna do a step mash, but one thing I wanted to cover first is how we are going to set up the Robo Brew the night before, so that in the morning when you wake up, you can get up and the water will be heated up for you, you'll be ready to go. So in order to do that, we're gonna to need to jump into looking at the controller, so let's take a look at that now. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to cover was how to switch it over from Celsius to Fahrenheit. When you first get the units, it will be in uh, Celsius, so just press and hold the temperature button, and it'll switch to Fahrenheit. Okay, now how are we gonna set this up for like a night before? I'm gonna say I wanna brew at nine o'clock in the morning, it's nine o'clock at night, which is 12 hours, just to make it simple. So I'm gonna go into auto mode, it's on S1. First thing I'm gonna do is gonna to go to the temperature and I'm gonna set that down to below the ambient temperature at least. I would say probably set it down to like 30 degrees just so you don't have any issues at all. Now once that's done, hit the time and then you can hold the plus key and what you can do is it will start, once it gets past 30 seconds, it'll start to click off hours and you'll see so now here's what's gonna happen. I could turn these elements on and whenever I hit play, it's gonna hold that 41 degrees for 10 hours. And then once it gets past the 10 hours, then it will go to step two. So let's go back to manual, or let's hit pause. Then we'll go back to manual mode. And we're gonna go back to auto mode. And then we're gonna push S2 and whatever the set temperature is you want your mash in to be, let's say it's 165. So we'll set it to 165. And then we'll go to time. Now what's gonna happen with this, it's not quite as intuitive as you would think. You need to set this for a couple of hours and what'll happen is it won't actually hold it for two hours once it reaches the 165 degree mark. It will just start the timer once that first step completes and then it will begin to heat it and then it will hold two hours and then after the two hours is over it'll start beeping and it will uh, let you know that it's reached the end of the timer it won't it won't stop heating but it'll, it'll just hold that temperature until you get to that point so um, there we've got two hours so we've set 10 hours on the first one on s1 let me go through here s1 uh, 10 hours and then two hours, so basically at the end of 12 hours, we should be heated to 165 degrees, and that's how you do the preheat. Here, here's what the step mash is gonna be. So we're gonna mash in with uh, 4.67 gallons at 108 degrees in order to hit our first step of 105 degrees. We're gonna hold that for 10 minutes, and then we're gonna go to the next stage and heat up to 128 degrees Fahrenheit, and we're gonna hold that for five minutes. And then the next step is gonna be 144 degrees. We'll hold that step for five minutes, and then finally, we're going to get to our final mashing step, which is 152 degrees, and we're going to hold that for 30 minutes. And uh, after that, we'll do a 168 degree raise to mash out temperature. And I will show you how all that is programmed into the controller. And let's take a look at that right now. Now, here's the way you set up the mash steps. So you can leave the first two steps in there where it ramped up. And then let's say you want to have your next step. You want to hold it at 145 degrees for 20 minutes. The interesting thing about this is the timer will automatically start after S2. And so it's not gonna actually hold it for 20 minutes. It will only start the timer for 20 minutes 
on its way to 145. So if you're going to ramp up and hold it for a certain temperature, you're going to need to calculate approximately how long it's going to take for it to get to the 145 degrees. My experience has been with the 500 watt element on, it's about 15 minutes or more. With the 1000 watt element on, it's about 10 to 12. And I've seen where some people have both elements on and it is you know somewhere 10 minutes or under to ramp up by 10 degrees. So once you get that set, then you will hit the next S key uh, and then that will take you to your next step mash temperature. Again, like I said, you're gonna have to calculate in there how long you want it to hold, including the ramp, not just the time you want it to hold. Now, the interesting thing is you would think from here you hit the play button, but that's not the case because it's going to start right wherever you had it set at. So you want to go back into hit the pause button, go back through all your steps and then start back at step one. Or if, if you've, you know, if you've already done the preheat and then you're at step two, then you'll want to go back to step three where you start the time and then it will continue on from there. And then whatever step you have it at, at the end, it will hold that step for, I don't know, an indefinite period of time as far as I can tell from what I've seen. So uh, one thing I do want to point out, so if you are in your, let me shut these off. If you are in your step mash mode and let's say it didn't ramp up as quickly as you wanted it to and you want to extend the time on this particular stage, you will have to hit pause and then you would think you can go and hit temperature or time, but that's not the case, it won't work. So you have to drop back down into manual mode then go back up into auto mode, go through your steps until you get to the one you want to change. Then you can change your time and extend it if you want to. So that's just a little tip there, something I found out. So hope that helps. Back to the video. All right, so you can see even with all of the steps that we're doing in this mash today that there is still another step that you could use if you wanted to. And you don't necessarily have to do step mashing to use that programmable feature. You could certainly use it to heat up the water on the first you know, two steps and then use the third step for your mash temperature and then another step for mash out temperature and then you could even use another one to bring it up to boil and then you know put your boil length of time in there 60 minutes or whatever and the unit would shut off after that so enough of all that stuff let's mash in and we'll get this thing going i did use the bottom screen despite some of the stuff that i was seeing online with people having some issues with it i did go ahead and use the bottom screen because i want to find out you know if it if it is worth using or not and if there's a problem that's had with it but uh, I did see some people have some issues with it so hopefully we'll have success today and I thought that this was kind of the perfect beer to do that with because if you're gonna have a problem uh, with a beer with you know grains it's gonna be a wheat beer so this thing is over let's see how many percent it's uh, 54 and a half percent wheat beer or wheat malt so um, it's definitely got plenty of wheat in there to test the capabilities of that bottom screen and then hopefully that step mashing will help out with the uh, process on that. So I'm going to go ahead and get mashed in here. And you obviously want to stir it in really good when you do your mash in. So try to keep prevent any dough balls. And that's the nice thing about having it in a bag. I can kind of control the flow as it goes in. So. like a pretty thick mash with all this wheat in there so it's uh, I use my profile incidentally for this for the uh, the one that I created for the version 2 and uh, some people have asked some questions about that profile about you know not being any dead space in the water ton measurement there's not really any a lot of dead space I know there's a big space underneath of the the malt pipe on this but there's not really any dead space that you don't recover from so that measurement in rope in the um, Robo brew profile that I did shows like zero and the reason being is because there's not really any uncaptured space down below so I just I kind of compensated for that by doing a thicker mash or a thinner mash uh, 1.7 quarts per pound so that is why I did that if you notice that a lot of people have been doing 1.5 but as you can see with this it's this is pretty darn thick really so that'll be it'll be interesting to see how this does let me get this all stirred in and uh, we will start recirculating and see what we come up with. I am not using the silicone ring around the top. I don't think it's absolutely necessary just because of the fact that, you know, it doesn't fit in the mall pipe very well. And you know, I, I just, I don't see a reason for it. A lot of people don't even use the top screen. So um, I'm, I'm just not even going to use the silicone ring around it. So let's uh, get that in there and uh, see how it does. 
So far, it looks pretty good. Not filling up too much. I personally don't think it's a big issue for it to be draining down the center tube, but some people do. I've got it about three quarters of the way open now. We'll see what happens there with that. It looks like it's still, looks like it's maintaining a pretty good drain, so I think we're pretty good there, quite honestly. So I am going to go ahead and uh, cut the flow off, put the lid back on, and we will start our step mashing. All right, we'll see you in a few. Okay, so we reached the end of mash out, and I just wanted to kind of make note after it got done with the last timer, it is sitting there beeping, letting you know that the last mash step or the last step is done. So we will get ready to mash out now. All right, so we've reached the mash out temperature or mash out stage. I'm going to turn off the pump and uh, get started on the mash out. And I got a little tool here <clears throat> that I just picked up. And that is... A winch and this thing looks to be very easy to use for getting the basket up out of there so let me get uh, everything situated on that and uh, I'll hook this thing up up here and uh, we'll get the basket pulled out of there so be back in a second all right so I got the lifting arm put in there got the winch hooked up to it and one of the things about the winch it just makes it so much easier and I, you know I personally I can lift it but it is pretty heavy so I thought, you know, for $15, I found it at Harbor Freight. I thought, why not go ahead and do that? Because, I mean, it it literally double. I think it might quadruple your actual lifting power. So it doesn't have a locking mechanism to it, but it actually works really easily. I mean, it's, you can see how easy I'm having to pull on this thing to get it up out of there. So I think it's definitely a uh, worthwhile addition to your brew house if you are maybe shorter or... You know, don't want to have to deal with lifting all of that weight out of there. I find it was super easy to do that, and uh, you know, made it a lot easier than the than the brew days on my uh, V2 that I've had. So I will go ahead and get this taken down. And I've got uh, water in here in my big uh, boil kettle that I'm using to mash out with. Obviously, you can heat it with whatever you whatever you desire on the stove or hot plate or whatever. I will get to the sparge and I will see you on the other side. Incidentally, I also did the same trick as I did before with the version 2 review or brew day on it. I put it like an Egyptian level on here. I don't know if you can see it on the camera or not, but uh, I've got some markings on the outside that I transferred around the back and I'm going to sparge until I get to, I think it's like six and a quarter gallons or six and a half gallons, something like that. So I will get the sparge going and I will see you guys in a minute. All right, so we have got it up to a boil. Everything is looking good so far, and the recipe that I'm doing called for an ounce of uh, Cascade. I, the Cascade that I got from my local home brew shop was like 6.3% alpha acids, which was quite a bit different than what the recipe called for. I think it was like 4 or something like that. So I am actually moving the hop addition for the bittering to the 30 minute mark instead of the 60 minute mark so that I achieve about 20 IBUs. But uh, everything's gone good so far, no problems with it. Uh, there's a few little quirky things with the, the mash steps that uh, I'm going to cover in my wrap up. But other than that, you know, everything's gone as planned and pretty good. So I am going to do a little different technique than I've done before with the chilling. And I, I kind of said this online the other day was uh, I'm going to try running the wort through the stainless steel coil in a bucket of water. Uh, and then I'm going to switch some of the water over to ice after we knock that initial heat off of there. All right, we are 30 minutes into the boil, and I'm going to add the first ounce of Cascade hops. One thing I do recommend with these is definitely getting either a hop uh, screen like this or a hop spider or even doing just like a muslin bag or something like that because of the fact that the pumps on these can get clogged and it's no fun. Also, the screen in the bottom can get clogged, and I had experienced that in the first... Uh, review that I did in the version 2. So I'm going to recirculate through the this uh, chilling coil So I definitely want to make sure that I don't have any obstructions with that. So I'll go ahead and add the hops and The next edition of hops will be at flame out and we will see you then All right, so we are closing in on the end of the boil 
and I've got to add my last ounce of Cascade hops once we get there. And they have everything set up. I've got a cam lock with a cam lock to cam lock connector, female to female. And uh, I'll just, well, there's the end of the boil. Let me turn these elements off real quick. So the connector that I've got in there is one of these here. Come on, if I can get it off there. It's a simple double-ended connector. So that'll work to connect the pump to the coil. And then I've got the coil in a bucket here with cold water in it. And water temperature right now is about 53 degrees here. And so I'm going to run some of the wart through it and then I'll probably drain some of the water off because of the fact that I'm going to have some heating of that water and I don't want to dump the ice into hot water. So I'll run a little bit of uh, wart through the chiller while I'm doing that. I'll probably siphon a little bit out, maybe add a couple, you know, add some more water back to it. And then when I get it chilled down a little bit, I'll go ahead and dump the ice in there. And uh, I will be back here in just a few minutes with my final thoughts. All right, so everything is chilled in the fermenter. It did take about 25, 26 minutes for it to chill down to about 77 degrees. I went ahead and stopped it there and put it in the fermenter and then I'll pitch the yeast once it settles down a little bit more. So my final thoughts are this. Uh, let's talk about the improvements first. The improvement of the cam lock was much needed. I did use the screen at the bottom of the malt pipe. And I think that was a nice addition. One thing I do want to point out on that is you want to make sure that you are using the bottom screen with the large nut on the bottom, not on the top. If you use it the other way, you're going to have the issue where it's not going to sit flat on there and you're going to have some problems. So that's a recommendation on that. As far as the mash steps or the mash uh, programming, I will use it, but not for step mashing. And here's why. Until they fix the programming issue where it will go to a certain point and then not start the timer until the temperature reaches that, I don't want to do the calculations and try to figure out how quickly the system is going to ramp up. So I will use it for preheating. I will use it for, you know, timing my mash and then raising at that final step. So I think it is useful from that aspect, but I think it does need a little bit more programming on it for it to be 100% useful. Not a bad thing, but it is, uh, it is lacking a little bit in that. So Kate Glenn, if you're watching. <laughs> um, other than that, everything is, is really nice on the unit. It performed just exactly as the V2 did, but with those additional features. I, I will tell you, I did come a little bit low on my gravity, but a lot of that had to do with pH, and we're going to cover some of that in the next video, which I, I'm not too upset about it. I was curious whether or not the step mashing would adjust the pH, as it said, according to what I you know read about it, but it didn't do much. It did a little bit, but not a lot. So I will be interested to see how the system works as far as, you know, the next time I brew on it, I'm going to adjust the pH and the water composition and all that stuff. So I'll have that for you guys next. But all in all, I think uh, upgrades are great on it. I like that they added the, the hose to it so you don't have to buy that. And, you know, overall, I'm, I'm pleased with the unit. I, I can't say that uh, I find really anything wrong with it other than that programming issue. So if you like the video, give us a thumbs up. We certainly appreciate that. As always, we appreciate the support people that buy the t-shirts and everything. Uh, again, this has been Brian for Short Circuit of Brewers. We'll see you on the next video.